Hey everyone, welcome to another week of Political Capital here. Thanks so much for being with us on your best BC political podcast. You're subscribed and listening to us right now on many platforms, the Googs, the Trons, the Apps, the IGs, the Grams. We are everywhere and we're on Check TV on Sunday, 6.30 and on uh, the YouTubes. So thank you for joining us. I want to bring in our panel because we got a lot to talk about not just COVID, uh, but a number of, well, mostly COVID, but a number of other things that uh, that are happening at the legislature. It's in full swing in the middle of a session, uh, some discussion of the budget, some other things going on. So we'll get into it now with our panel. As usual, go around, say hello to McLean K from the Orca. Hi, McLean. Hey, Rob. How are you? Uh, well, you're not supposed to ask that. You're just supposed oh, to say, right. hey, yeah, how you yeah. doing? Okay. Now you've made it weird. It's all awkward now. It's fine. It's cool. Successful. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, Jillian Oliver, Green Strategist. Hey, Jillian. How are you? Thanks for being here. Good. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. And, and Katie Merrifield, uh, BC Liberal Strategist, Vice President of Wellington Advocacy. Hello, Katie. Thanks for putting me back on TV, Rob. Oh, you're welcome. It's uh, <laughs> Bonnie Henry couldn't do two weeks in a row. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's good. I'm, you guys are my panel, and I'm so glad you're here, and everybody is glad that you are going to kick us off on the topic of sick pay, which we've sort of addressed in the past, but it really took off this week. Uh, the Premier had a couple days of press conferences just overwhelmed by the question of why is British Columbia doing nothing on paid sick leave? Uh, why is it waiting for the federal government to do something? What is the issue at play? Why is there nothing happening here? Uh, but it did eventually get to the point where the premier said, yeah, we're, we're going to do something. We're not quite sure what it is and when, but uh, what are the factors that are going on? What, what do you make of this issue this week? Uh, McLean, why don't we start with you? Yeah, you know, I think to understand this issue, you almost have to work backwards in that we just arrived at Horgan saying, yes, we will put in place some kind of paid sick leave program here in BC. But that happened after the province said that they would not be doing it. This is since last week's budget. But I think they were spurred into doing it because Ontario was. And they don't dare allow, you know, Doug Ford to be more progressive on an issue than anything. And the reason Doug Ford got spurred into issue, into action was because of the same pressures in Ontario that there's, the federal government is not doing something. Uh, there is no federal paid sick leave program. Uh, and again, the federal budget was just last week. And BC has said that they have been advocating at a national level for some kind of uh, program, but obviously that has not yet come to pass. And so that's why we are where we are, um, part waitly, partly waiting rather for Ottawa to do something and also partly feeling some pressure that Doug Ford of all people is further ahead on this one. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? The progressive conservative government of Ontario realizing the social imperative for sick days and the Democrat government in British Columbia arguing about who's going to pay for it with the federal government. It's just a, it's a weird dynamic. I agree with you. Uh, Katie, uh, what do you make of this? We think on the surface, this seems like a no brainer policy wise. We know many essential workers uh, can't work from home. We know COVID spreads in workplaces, and we know that sick people shouldn't go to work. But um, I guess in sort of defense of the government, executing a program like this is very expensive. Uh, it's pretty ripe for abuse. And even if the government says it's temporary until COVID passes, like stakeholders are going to be out immediately, loud and proud, asking for this to be permanent. So, uh, and then from a political perspective, the, the government has to appease stakeholders kind of on both sides here. Uh, on the labor front, you know, they want 10 days covered. Uh, and then on the business side, you know, this is a, a sector that's been struggling so much since the beginning of the pandemic. So the government doesn't want to push any more uh, unfair burden on them as well. So it's, this is hard, uh, but that said, like, We've been in this pandemic for over a year now, and I believe the premier said in December that BC was prepared to go at this alone if the feds uh, if the feds didn't kick anything in. So, for, you know, from my perspective, it shouldn't take five months to come up with this alternative strategy, particularly because Premier Horgan was uh, the chief advocate at the premier's table on this issue. Mm -hmm. Some strategy. The government says it has some document from the summer that it's going to resurrect. We're not sure what it is. Um, Jillian, any any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate that there's been so much posturing between the federal and provincial governments over this, because I mean, like, by the time we get it done, we're going to be like, you know, largely vaccinated, which is absurd, like we needed this a year ago. Um, but I also thought it was funny that it sort of like popped up again, right on everybody's radar right after the budget. And, you know, I think everybody was kind of waiting to see what was in them, obviously. But I also think that 
everybody in BC politics kind of dropped the ball on this one and that the opposition parties sort of like it wasn't really on their radar because they just assumed that the end like you know it's a labor issue a lot of NDP allies are advocating for it they just thought that it would be taken care of but it wasn't um so I think it's a reminder for everybody to sort of you know make sure that you're keeping your eye on the ball um even when it's issues that you might not normally think you have to um and yeah, I think it'll be interesting to see how it rolls out. It does sound like the premier is open to making it permanent, which might mean some changes to the Employment Standards Act. That's certainly what um, advocates are, are looking for because they say that just implementing a temporary program or a program that you have to apply for is not good enough because um, you know that leaves a lot of workers without a without like immediate pay. They take it's cumbersome to apply for. It takes time to get your money, um, and might you know end up being effective and causing people to go to work when they're sick still. Yeah, it's got to be quick. Whatever they come up with needs to pay someone for a sick day quick so it doesn't disrupt their paycheck. They're not, you know, people live their lives paycheck to paycheck these days for your rent or your mortgage, your expenses. If suddenly you go to apply for something and it takes four weeks to get payment back, your finances are gone for the week or two that you took off in the previous months. So the premier was talking about how difficult it is to create that. I kind of think I am struck by what, how the NDP didn't take the easiest path out of this, which would have been to just hit businesses with the requirement that they pay for sick days. That That's, you know, kind of what New Democrat allies would like them to do. And the premier has been, I you know, surprisingly moderate in the way he's gone about this, saying we're not going to download it onto businesses. We're not going to force them in a moment of crisis to eat these costs, even though they could have done it months ago and it would have been a quick and easy win for them amongst their supporters. So I, kind of, to me, one of those examples of, you know, Horgan's getting criticized for taking so long, but taking so long is going to produce a policy that's a lot less traditional New Democrat uh, policy than we might have thought this government would do with its supermajority and its ultimate control and, and all of that. So I'll be fascinated to see what it is. I think you're right, Jillian. I think it, it'll probably end up being permanent. Um, Katie, you mentioned that as well, but uh, yeah. but it may well, not be. As, I think if, stakeholders want it to be permanent. Yeah. Just for the record, we can probably talk about this later. I don't think it's surprising at all that... Yeah. Uh, that they are trying to appease their business stakeholders. Their biggest vulnerability is their time in government in the 90s. They want to get as far away uh, as they can from that. And so this is a government that talks left and governs right. So, yeah, we we spoke about that on other podcasts too, yeah. about that. And this kind of fits into that uh, box that we're painting for the NDP, which is quite a fascinating uh, way to look at it. I know the BC Federation of Labor is a little bit frustrated because they have this clear ask for a long time and uh, they're not getting it. Uh, and so they're wondering why when the NDP have ultimate control of the legislature right now. We'll keep an eye on that. Let's move on to another topic here, which was the just <laughs> gong show situation at secretive pop-up vaccine sites in Fraser Health, which turned into a political disaster for the NDP government this week. Basically, someone in Fraser Health came up with the idea of going to the most populous areas in the province, uh, the hotspots, uh, and holding secretive um, pop-up vaccine clinics in parking lots where the address and location and time and eligibility aren't published in advance. It's spread by word of mouth and rumor and WhatsApp and text chains that people show up. And then sure enough, on uh, Wednesday, more than 500 people were at Surrey's Newton Athletic Park lined up. Uh, people been sleeping overnight and standing in the cold and in the rain waiting for a vaccine. Some of them did not get it. These kind of memes appeared of how getting a vaccine was like the Hunger Games um, running around town trying to find one of these pop-up clinics with Fraser Health, refusing to acknowledge they even exist when their staff are there and hundreds of people are there waiting for the vaccines. Lots of apologies. This reverberated a couple days through the house. Um, what did you make of it, Jillian, when you saw how this all kind of played out? Uh, I think that it has become increasingly clear that the government has some communication problems around COVID, especially in the third wave where everybody is just so done with everything. Um, they've tended to keep information really close to their chest. And it was crazy like that, that, yeah, like you said, nobody knew that these were happening. Like you couldn't even get confirmation that they were happening as they were happening. Um, and I think that, that there are other jurisdictions that have done this a lot better. Um, in Toronto, they just 
said what postal codes were like they were going to be targeting and then people were aware of that in advance they were able to book vaccines they went quickly for sure um like i don't think you're ever going to design a perfect pop-up you know vaccination site because at the end of the day i think getting jabs in people quickly is sort of the overall strategy here but you know they targeted specific workplaces um specific high-rise apartment buildings in high-risk areas um and there's also been successful pilots working really closely with community organizations like in the downtown east side where they've been really, really successful, um, partnering with people that are sort of anchored in that community that know how people are getting their information um, and know how to sort of build trust with people. Um, so yeah, I think that this was sort of like a reflection of the government's very um, tendency to sort of keep information and keep control really, really tight um, and to not sort of trust uh, community partners like we saw with pharmacists when they were doing the AstraZeneca rollout. Um, and I think that, you know, it'd be, if they're going to do this again, I think that they have some uh, paths forward to do it better. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they're going to do it again. I think the combination of the apologies we heard from Fraser Health, Dr. Henry, and Adrian Dix combined with what I would imagine, and McLean, you can weigh in on this, would be just an intense pushback from New Democrat Surrey MLAs who watch their community treated like a third world country. People lined up begging for vaccines in fields for most of their day. I cannot imagine that that went over well. Uh, it were the strategists in the New Democrats who place Syria above all other regions as a as a vote getting uh, community that they target in the elections. I don't. What did you make of that? Yeah, I mean, if you imagined if this had not happened in Surrey or anywhere else in British Columbia, if you had pictured this exact same scene happening in the southern U.S., Alabama, Mississippi, with people lined up in a field not knowing if they're going to get a vaccine, it is exactly the kind of image that Canadians and British Columbians would shake their heads at and say, you know, thank God we live in Canada. Had that happened in Alberta, I feel like much of the commentary here would have a very similar reaction, you know, how that's, of course, it's a failed society. And of course, that's the kind of thing that happens under that government. And the fact that it happened here is astonishing. And it, it honestly, the um, people should be embarrassed because people having to take an entire day or longer and uh, line up in a field uh, or a parking lot to maybe get a chance at a vaccination is it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And they, they got handed tickets at one yeah. point during the day and everyone thought the ticket meant a vaccine, but they didn't have enough vaccines to match the tickets. So there was a bunch of people with tickets at the end of the day who were furious, just yelling at these uh, health officials and, Oh, it, it devolved. Uh, just communications nightmare, unmitigated disaster uh, that undermined public confidence in the vaccination system, according to Adrian Dix when he finally apologized for it. Uh, Katie, what do you think? I personally think that this was an amazing strategy uh, to launch a food truck or <laughs> a flash mob or maybe an underground drum and bass concert. <laughs> like, seriously. New sneaker. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. They did three things. They started a whisper campaign while officially denying that anything was happening. They got their digital influencers to spread the word on WhatsApp and other platforms. And they always maintained a huge lineup just to prove how hot their spot was. Uh, but seriously, I actually agree wholeheartedly with McLean that this was de a deplorable embarrassment. And uh, obviously, this should never happen again. Like, it makes no sense to drop an incredibly valuable life-saving commodity right in the center of the third fastest growing city in the country. Like, I'm from Surrey. Like, you know, if you put something like that in front of us, we are going to come in droves and get it, elbows up. And the fact that we saw hundreds of people waiting in line for their entire day and then turned away, like that's just, that's going to have ramifications, I think, in Surrey electorally. Mm -hmm. Well, I can't imagine it was by design. I mean, no one in the political side of government would ever have allowed this to happen. This seems like the a Fraser Health thing that got out of control, that there wasn't enough oversight. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You, yeah. C you cannot imagine someone in Oak Bay or Point Grey standing in a field in the cold rain for six hours to get a vaccine. There's a weird, and the Liberals brought this up in, briefly in, in question period. I thought it was very interesting. There's a weird, dark, disturbing undertone to the mainly, um, you know, uh, non-English speaking immigrant family populations of Surrey that were treated this way when wealthier, mainly whiter uh, British Columbians get to book 15-minute pharmacy appointments uh, in their community and roll up and uh, get vaccinated without ever having to basically step out into the elements. And that, th the fact that we're talking about that is so disappointing uh, at this point in the in the campaign. I think there will be ripple effects of this 
um, through probably New Democrat Surrey MLAs and then back to the health minister himself who allowed this, I think, to get way too far out of control. So I didn't never thought we'd see that, but um, that's not a great sign. In a general sense, though, we're making pretty good progress overall in vaccinations outside of this. Um, we're accelerating our vaccine program and a whole bunch of other things. Make sure you go to the government website if you're looking to see if you're eligible and how to register and all of that. Disclaimer, none of us are doctors, etc., etc., etc. Moving on to our last topic here in the po- in the video podcast, we got more to talk about in the audio podcast, so make sure you subscribe. Tent cities and homelessness. The deadline has arrived to clear Strathcona Park and Beacon Hill Park in Victoria. Uh, the go- NDP government's put a lot of money into buying hotels and other shelter spaces to try and meet this deadline with Housing Minister David Eby. Let's go around the table and see what you think of these strategies, McLean. Um, is this doable or not? Or what do you think? Uh, well, I mean, I think there's already been an extension granted in Beacon Hill Park where uh, there's another 15 days. So it's kind of a deadline with an asterisk. It's a harder deadline in Strathcona Park. I understand there's some closing ceremonies or, or something to that effect happening literally as we speak. Um, my takeaway from all this is that tent cities and encampments, 24 seven encampments, we've now had a number of times to try this experiment and they just don't work. And there is a problem here in Victoria and Vancouver as well, where there's this false binary and it's very toxic where you say, well, either you tolerate these kind of encampments or you hate the poor. And it's just, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible um, discourse that's out there right now. But the problem is um, all of the issues that have led to these encampments are, are real and we do need to do more about that. But that does not change the fact that wherever these these 24 seven entrenched camps spring up, there are hideous problems with crime, with theft, with victimization. Um, it's, it's happened over and over and over again and it, we're long past the point of being able to pretend that's not going to happen. And I, I think we need to close the book, that, that we need to find solutions and that we can't ignore them, but that cannot be one of them anymore. Mm-hmm. Jillian, what do, you th- what do you think? I think that it's you know obvious how important this issue is to voters. This is like, aside from COVID, the issue that we're seeing the government act with the greatest sense of urgency on. Um, and I think that they're acting so early in their term of government and so quickly shows how much work they think there is. And that's absolutely a correct assessment. Um, this is the third, Strathcona Park is the third encampment that the province or the city has shut down in you know, a couple handful of years. Um, and a US study found that you know, when you do shut down encampments, they tend to just spring up in other places. Um, and that's because you're not addressing the systemic issues underlying them, like McLean said, and they are very uh, complicated and the result of decades of systemic failure. Like everything that is not working in our society is sort of resulting and leading into this situation. You know, it, it's good that the government is Uh, spending more money on mental health, that they're spending more money on trying to build not just these temporary shelters, but permanent homes for people to live in. But, you know, at the same time, we're seeing funding cuts in our education system, um, which leads to fewer counselors, fewer services, you know, bigger class sizes that don't support students. Um, And that's just one example. So we also have the housing crisis, obviously, um, and worsening wealth inequality. So I think that obviously people care about this issue, but uh, a lot. but I think that we all need to recognize that solving them is going to require a lot of difficult choices on all our parts because there are so many issues that lead to this and they're all very uh, expensive and complicated to fix. Mm-hmm. Katie? Yeah, at a macro level, you know, efforts to disband tent cities and to, to house the homeless uh, are positive. I don't think many people would disagree with that on principle, but I agree with what um, with Jillian said with these systemic issues. Like where I get concerned is when wraparound services is just kind of dropped into a, a news release as a as a platitude like that is where we really need to focus in on this is a, a population that has some critical mental health and addictions needs um, and so like their recovery capital needs to be assessed they need to be treated accordingly along the continuum of care and I think sometimes that is uh, that's an afterthought um, on whether or not these are going to pop up again like of course they are, We've, we have a precedent for it. And we do know that there is a number, a uh, small number of core anarchist uh, career activists that seemingly exist to cause mayhem where and when it suits them. And unfortunately that takes away from the real suffering of this population that needs housing and needs critical mental health uh, support. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting I, to, to see if they do continue, given the astronomical amount of money and effort that David Eby has directed at this in a short period of time, more than $200 million in purchases and housing in Metro Vancouver, just in Vancouver, um, tens and tens of millions of dollars here in Victoria to buy places, to find shelter spaces, to get people who want a space uh, out if they want. Um, whether it's going to work or not, it'll probably require another month to sort of sift through what's happening here. But uh, it's uh, you're right, um, Jillian, it's an interesting priority of government. It's very early in its mandate. We only have a minute left here. I want to go around quickly on a hot take uh, to pick up on this vaccine issue we were at. Um, would you panel stand in a field for five and a half hours for the chance of getting vaccinated at this point in the pandemic mclean you're shaking your head no nope too much work to do got to pick up my kid from school okay all right jillian yeah i have a baby so i don't do anything for five hours not even sleep (laughs) no (laughs) all right katie uh i wouldn't wait in line i would just go to the front and tell them that i was with the dj (laughs) <laughs> you say it like you've done it before and it's work <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> all right okay that's great um thanks everyone uh make sure you stick around we got more to talk about in the podcast portion uh and we will be back next week with all the latest in bc politics thanks for listening more episodes of political capital are available at checknews.ca slash podcasts or search Political Capital wherever you listen to podcasts.